All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Fraud Education's free webinar series on college admissions, this time related specifically to the pass-fail system offered in high schools and what that system means for your high schooler going into college this year, next year, two years, three years, four years down the road. Mm -hmm. Knowing that some of the, you know, the policies of the schools could potentially impact your college admissions chances. There is some misinformation, some good information out there about pass and fail. We're here joined by my colleagues from all around the country at Fraud Education um, who's had school counseling experience or currently have the school counseling experience to tell us about pass fail system and the impact on college admissions. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ibrahim Farad. I'm the chief educational consultant at Fraud Education. A little bit background about me and about Fraud Education. Um, I've been in educational consulting for 15 years now, 12 years with Fraud Education, and I've started out as an SAT and ACT tutor. Um, who clocked in over 10,000 hours of tutoring for the SAT and ACT and moved into college admissions consulting and clocked in over 14,000 hours of college admissions consulting. I've published nine books in school and college admissions um, and I've, my students have had over a thousand college acceptances around the country, including international. 38 of these colleges have been IVs, uh, 14 of them international, and I have visited over 280 colleges around the country, and our students have earned over $88 million in total merit-based scholarships. Um, and a little bit about Fraud Education. Uh, we were founded in 2008 in Houston. Uh, we're a 12-year-old company now. In fact, April is our anniversary, so this is literally the 12 years old mark. Um, over a thousand students served. We have 11 consultants around the country, uh, four of whom you're seeing right now on your screen. We're in nine cities um, and two physical offices in the Houston area. area. Our students have earned um, at least a nine point growth on the ACT from baseline to their official testing and 390 points on the SAT from their baseline to their official testing. 98% um, of our students have gotten into their top, at least one of their top two choices. So uh, we're very proud, very excited about this opportunity to continue to educate the public on college admissions during COVID-19. So I would like to have our panelists introduce themselves as well. So I'll go to Courtney first. Courtney. Hi, Ibrahim. Thank you for um, doing this. Thanks for having me. Um, a little bit about me. I've been in um, the world of education for over 15 years. Um, 12 years of that has been in specifically with college consulting, college admission consulting. Um, I've advised, you know, well over 500 plus students um, and um, have visited over 20 colleges around the country. Um, many of those have been Ivy Leagues, um, probably logged over 10,000 hours um, of college admissions consulting um, just w over the years. Um, and um, students have earned um, about well over $10 million in merit aid um, that I've worked with. So Awesome. And now you're in Phoenix area as well. Oh, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Uh, let's go to Nishan. Hello, um, glad to be with you today doing this webinar and my name is Nishan Jones and I'm based in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I have over 20 years of educational consulting. Um, I joined the Farad uh, education in February of this year and glad to be a part of a dynamic team um, that works to help students um, Get, get into their dream college. Um, I have consulted over 800 students um, in college admissions and financial aid and affordability. Um, there are approximately probably 1200 um, acceptance or more. Um, it's just hard to keep uh, count, uh, 25 of which uh, Ivy League acceptances. I have visited colleges all over um, the United States, over 40 colleges. Um, over 2 million in merit-based uh, scholarships. 
Um, I specifically um, have a doctoral degree in higher education administration, working with students, specifically uh, first-generation students. I have a certificate in college admission counseling from UCLA and a certificate from Harvard University um, in college admissions, and I am a part of uh, NACAT. So I'm glad to be a part of this panel with all of these lovely ladies and sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Nishan. Casey. Hi, I'm Casey Harmon. Um, I'm based out of the San Francisco Bay Area. So I do a lot of work with uh, students specifically staying in California, but I'm knowledgeable about um, all sorts of different schools, mostly in the Western United States. Um, I've been in education for 13 years as an academic counselor um, at the same school for the last 13 years. I have a master's in education as well as a PPS credential. Um, and then I've been in education for about 20 years. Um, so I've, I've taught social science and I've taught um, elementary level students. Um, I just recently joined Farat in March, so it's been great. I've really enjoyed um, getting to know our amazing team and just learning so much more about the admissions process and um, just working with a lot of people that are uh, really interested in helping students and seeing them succeed. Um, I've had over 10,000 year, or 10,000 years, <laughs> 10,000 hours of um, consulting uh, with college admissions with students. Um, I've, I've had a lots and lots of acceptances um, throughout the United States, a lot in California, about 500, um, but it's hard to keep track of all of that. Um, nine Ivy League acceptances. I've visited over 35 colleges and universities um, on the West Coast, mostly. Um, and then I've had, you know, students um, receive about ten, like 2 million in merit-based scholarships. Lots of, uh, we, we work with a lot of students on local scholarships too, doing that. Um, I'm a member of um, the American School Counseling Association, and I'm also the college board coordinator at my school, as well as the NCAA coordinator at my school, um, among other things. So I'm excited to be here and talk to you guys about um, the pass fail and understanding all the uh, intricacies of that. Thank you, Casey. Cheryl. Hi, um, I am Cheryl Jansen, and I think I'm the newest member of this team. I'm just joining Farat. Uh, this month, actually. So at least I'll always remember my anniversary date, uh, which will be pretty fabulous. I have 27 years in education, and that's kind of split between Michigan and Tennessee. Um, I have three years as a college and career counselor, specifically. I have 10 years as a um, high school counselor, um, just spending time in the high schools, working with, you know, scheduling and um, helping that college admission process through that. And then I have 17 years as a um, English language arts instructor, um, which is, falls into a lot of my passion at helping those students write those admissions essays, which I think we'll talk about quite a bit later as we look at what's really going to be a focus point of potential college admissions. Um, I have about a million dollars in merit aid for my students um, so far, and I have over 20 college visits. Um, I have an EDS in curriculum and instruction, um, but my passion tends to come from helping students raise those ACT scores. Um, Tennessee is a ACT state, um, and so I have really, I have logged thousands of hours helping students prepare for um, that test and to really gear in and see what the test is about and raise that, um, raise their scores there. I do carry national boards for counseling and school counseling. Um, so I'm super excited to be here and uh, to just talk about this whole pass fail um, new thing, not new thing that is joining, um, that the country is hearing about, I think is a good way mm -hmm. of saying that. 
Excellent. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks for joining. So um, as you can see, we have a combined experience of almost 90 years in school counseling as well as education here. So you're in good hands with regards to the advice that you're about, you're about to hear. Uh, I'm a, I forgot to mention that I'm a member of NACAC as well as IECA and all of our consultants are in the process of or have already attained their membership with the IECA, Independent Educational Consultants Association. So with that, let me give you a brief background about why we're doing this. Um, with pass fail, um, that just came into place after pretty much March, the first week of March for many, many states that have gone remote learning, virtual learning, and because of the conditions and accessibility and equity issues that are surrounding the um, remote learning, Schools, most school districts um, have decided to go pass fail system. Some private schools are even going to pass fail system in different parts of the country. Um, that doesn't mean every school does this, but many schools do. And when it comes to our clientele and the people we're hearing from the media and so on, there's that uncertainty and anxiety surrounding pass fail system because it directly impacts the college admissions process. The question is how and why? And is every pass fail the same or is grade, graded material better uh, than pass fail? Is it other way around or does it not matter? So that's why we're brought in these experts as a panel and I'll ask some questions to begin with. And you can use, those of you who are watching us on Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature at any time submit us your questions, know that we have reserved enough time at the end that we can address your live questions as well. We are also live on Facebook. However, nobody is monitoring uh, those questions. We will get to those questions after this live session has ended. So with that, let's jump right in and ask you the first question uh, about who has, in your experience, what has been the youngest grade to go pass fail and why do you think that it's okay to go pass fail for that group, but it feels so uncomfortable right now for high school and beyond? So let's go to Nishan to begin with. Uh, you're muted, Nishan. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, great, yes, uh, the youngest that we've seen it is uh, of course, pre-K through first grade. And I believe that pass-fail is an important for that particular uh, grade level because they're still building their skills, right? And um, teachers are, are learning where they are and you don't want to uh, set the mindset of the student up for failure of seeing a grade. Um, pass-fail also gives um, the teacher an opportunity to meet with the parents and talk, kind of talk about their strengths and what they are, what their strengths are, and areas of improvement. And so it is a, a great way to communicate with the student or to the student about where they are. Um, and pass fail is is appropriate, I believe, for that age. Okay, thank you. And Courtney, um, let, let me go to you about the same question. Yeah, sure. So about the same as Nishan, the earliest I've seen is about kindergarten, first grade, um, in my experience. And um, really, the goal um, with pass fail at that level is just to make sure that the students are comprehending and understanding the material, and they're ready to move on. Um, and that feels appropriate for the younger level grades. I think um, in this season, why pass fail feels weird and feels odd, especially for our high school juniors and seniors, um, is because they've had several years to show um, that they've comprehended the material, that they've moved on, that they're progressing. And now when they're getting ready to enter their next season of college, um, we've moved to this um, kind of reverted back to a, do they understand the material? Um, and so I think it feels a little uncomfortable, a little unsteady. Um, but hopefully through this webinar, um, parents and students will see that it'll be okay. <laughs> yep, yep. And it's interesting you guys mentioned that and, and, and you know, the fact that over the years, some uh, students have been used to getting grades, right? And there are countries out there, like, and they happen to be the Northern European super like high achieving kids and the students who go to college and be successful in their careers haven't had ever a grade in their lives. And 
they've all had pass fail. So we think about youngest ages, pre-K and first grade, and then talk about, wow, it's so weird to get a pass fail in high school. In many countries on the flip side who are really high achieving, they've been pass fail for a long time. So we're thinking about a, a potentially a mindset shift with what's happening today. And we're going to address that in a little bit as well. But before that, I want to ask one of our panelists who has been a teacher for a pass fail course. Cheryl, who is our Tennessee consultant, has been teaching for pass fail courses. And let me ask you, Cheryl, how, you know, how does that feel, first of all? And second of all, how is it different than a class you teach for a grade? Uh, that it's such a great question because I have students that come in and they're always anxious at any time students enter class that first couple of weeks they're very anxious and it's nice to watch those high achieving students settle in and actually own the learning as opposed to wanting the grade at the end of the course you know they want that grade they want that GPA they want to look good but it's so nice as a teacher to see them go I want to learn this because this is what's going to be good for me. This is going to benefit me for the rest of my life. And so it almost takes that pressure of the grade off of their plate and they can just really own the learning of it as opposed to being in that constant state of angst where they're looking for what do I have to do next to keep my GPA at this certain level. So pass or fail is, should not be viewed as a negative thing. Um, if anything, it should be, while it's different and high schoolers and even a lot of our college students right now are like, whoa, what is this? Um, I really think it's one of those things that um, if used advantageously is a good thing. And what grade uh, and what course did you teach in pass fail, Cheryl? That's a great question. I've done a couple of English classes that are pass fail. And then I also teach an ACT prep class, which is a pass fail class. So um, it shows up on their transcripts. Hey, they took this class um, and they passed it. But it also gives students the opportunity to really learn the ins and outs of that test um, without worrying about the grade at the end of it. And is this class going to hurt their GPA as opposed to helping it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And in fact, um, you know, that takes me to another question that's relevant, especially for our new high schoolers, like those ninth graders who have been adjusting to high school in the first semester, got a grade, obviously, for the first semester or, you know, trimester, whichever system they're on. And all of a sudden, their next semester, they're going to end up with a pass fail. So, does this affect ninth graders uh, to go pass fail this second semester, given that they had a grade the first semester? Casey, let me ask you that question first. Sure. Um, I did want to say something also. Um, oh, we, Casey has frozen. Um, about the previous question. Oh, oh hello. Yep, I can hear oh, you now. Okay, sorry. Um, I was going to go back to the first question really sure. quick, too. Um, I did want to piggyback on that because oftentimes students view the um, grading system, you know, they, they strive for that A, but the teachers, uh, having, having that pass-fail system often allows teachers to look at the student holistically, not just based on, you know, their grade that they earned but each student so i think that's really important to note um so in terms of being a freshman and how affecting um this the pass fail could affect freshmen um it's important to note that this is going to be on their transcript so you know depending on their first um semester how they did they're going to have that on their transcript but they'll also have this pass fail on their transcript for the second half of their freshman year um so that so that's a little bit different but it's it's a lot of schools in california are also adopting something kind of we're calling it a hybrid system where students are able to choose whether they want to go pass fail or whether they want to keep the traditional grading system so it's important if you're you know and parents get to make the decision and there is a timeline for that decision so um, make sure that you're contacting your student's school to see if that's an option if you want to go with the grading system or the pass fail system so that's an important thing to uh, consider um, 
because not all schools are adopting the pass fail system. Um, another thing in terms of living in California and applying to UCs and CSUs, um, a lot of people don't realize this, but for your freshman year, although the class that um, your classes you're taking um, count, obviously, the ones that you're taking, um, how it works is as a freshman, your GPA is not calculated in the admissions. So in, in that admissions process, they want to see that you've taken your biology class and you've taken your English class and you've taken, you know, those required A through G classes, but they're not going to take that GPA. They want to see that you've done well, but because they're not requiring that pass fail, it's not going to affect your GPA. The UCs and the CSUs look at your GPA, your sophomore and your junior year when making admissions decisions. So it's important that you focus on those two years the most. They'll see what you did as a freshman, but they don't count it in your GPA. So it is actually working for a benefit for a, a freshman student. Bob, that, that was a really good advice because we have some um, viewers right now who are interested in University of California and CSU system. So that is a big advice, especially if you have a ninth grader right now worried about these uh, past fail grades. Just know that what you just heard about ninth grade not being that big of an issue in terms of the overall GPA. That's a really good advice. Thank you, Casey. Same question, yeah. Nishan. How is this um, impacting the freshmen, especially in Texas? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think that all students are, are impacted by the pass fail, um, but I would say um, for every student to uh, make sure that you are focused with the work that has been given to you. Um, even though there's, you know, pass fail, you need to understand what your district has um, agreed to do. That's very important because um, you may have the option to select grades or pass fail and you want to know uh, at what level is passed and what level is, 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 is fail. And we know normally it's a 69 if it's a fail, but you want to be able to articulate um, what that grade means. In other words, you want to stay in contact with the instructor and say, you know, what would my grade be if it was a, a great a letter grade or a number a numerical grade um, you need to make sure also this is kind of putting you in the practice of being in college right now uh, document all of your assignments uh, the grades that you receive if it was past fail if it was an 80 and then be able to go to the instructor and say you know this is what I make can you kind of write me a letter of recommendation of my experience during this time um, capitalize on that and file that away. Um, so staying in the presence of your instructor, it's not brownie points, but it is uh, showing that you really care about your grade and that you're taking it seriously. Thank you. That's very good advice. I'm going to go to Courtney. Anything to add for the freshman class specifically, Courtney? Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, I love what all of my colleagues have said. Um, I agree with everything. Um, two things I kind of want to highlight just as it relates to freshmen is I love what both Cheryl and Casey said is that this is the time where students have the opportunity to learn for learning sake, right? Not specifically for a grade. Um, I think we um, are constantly working on students, um, to, you know, helping them to critically think and um, prepare for the future and engage in the material. But there's always that caveat of a grade. Um, and now they don't have that. And so being able to just engage in the material um, at a high level, um, whatever that looks like for a particular school or district, um, that's what I want to encourage freshmen to do now. Um, and I love what Nishan said about tracking everything. Um, the reality is, um, like Casey said, this will, this pass fail will be on their transcript, um, but they're not applying for college until the year 2023, right? Um, so we have um, significant time between now and then um, to remember this time, and we can't do that. Students and families can't do that if they don't have the information of kind of what happened during this one semester or one trimester of their freshman year. Um, so tracking and journaling, I think, is really, really important. 
the other thing I wanted to think about is, or mention is that this pass fail could actually be a relief in some students scenario. Um, if a freshman student has, if their home has been significantly impacted by COVID, so maybe their parents are healthcare workers, um, and now they have some extra responsibilities at home, this could provide some relief just in terms of the pressure that students typically put on themselves to do well um, in the sense that they just have to do the material that's been presented instead of, you know, the long laundry list of making an A um, and taking care of students or, or whatnot. So it could actually be a relief um, in some cases. And I really like the advice on the learning for the learning's sake. <laughs> I think that was a really good advice. And the fact that you mentioned all those skills, like critical thinking, researching, and learning how to do it, guess what? Those are the skills the colleges want from their prospective students anyway. So if anything, this should really help, but only if you do the work yourself as well as a student and as a parent encouraging your student to do so as well. Cheryl, any final thoughts on the freshmen and how their, their work is cut out for the pass bill system. Yeah, and um, Courtney just kind of nailed a lot of things. And Sean said something that really I wanted to touch on, and that is the idea of trend of grades. So this idea is a freshman having a pass or fail. That's okay. We talk to our students all the time about having this trend of grades. And if you come in as a freshman and you kind of struggle, but by the time your junior year rolls around, you're rocking and rolling and pulling those high GPAs, um, colleges consider that significantly. So this pass or fail in your freshman year is something to document, but also understand that colleges are already watching trends of grades. So coming in at this time, even though it is unprecedented, it is okay with that pass or fail. Um, especially as a freshman. The other thing that I really do want to um, mention is the idea of this opportunity for all of our students, not just freshmen, of what this can do for their admissions writing and their scholarship essays. You know, Courtney mentioned that idea of um, how it affects your family personally. We all know that those best essays come from the heart. They come from those personal stories. And so taking this opportunity and looking at how this opportunity changes you, affects you, grows you, um, is really something that if they document it well, they are going to have a very strong essay um, come a few years. So. It's interesting um, because when we, you know, when we hear college essays, for a ninth grader, it's almost like, oh, no, 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 there's no way. Like, I'm barely adjusting to high school, let alone you're telling me to think about my college essay. So, but I, I hear you totally. If we, we hear or think about the most impactful times of your life, this, a, a global pandemic probably counts for it. And especially, you know, how it impacts your family, how it impacts your daily life. Maybe you take care of your sibling maybe you tutor your sibling during these times because you know he's or she's struggling with the content those are all leadership opportunities that you can show in your college essay when the time comes even if it's going to be four years from today that's great journaling to do starting now so thank you so i think you all kind of hit the question the next question that's going to come but you know we don't know and there's a that that big gray area about how pass fail would get calculated in an overall GPA, especially because we know colleges are looking at um, the overall GPA, uh, weighted or unweighted, depends on the college. UCs don't look at the GPA from necessarily from freshman year, but they put more weight into the latter years. Every college does this differently, but do, how is it calculated? So let's go to um, uh, Cheryl first and let's hear how do you know knowing the pass fail classes that you already teach? Uh, well, you know, the pass fail classes um, in this area do not figure into their GPA. Uh, so some students that kind of goes, but I was counting on that to boost my GPA. Um, but at the same time, for those students who are coming in and it's content that is new to them um, or it's content that is totally out of their comfort zone, this is a great opportunity for them to explore that and really try something different. You know, I think about my STEM students that are very engineering, mathematically science, and then they walk into a creative writing class because it's what they want to try, but they don't know that they want the grade attached to that. Um, so that GPA not being fi figured or the, um, 
the pass or fail not being part of their GPA is almost an advantage to them in the sense that they, again, get to make some choices that allows them to grow as people, to, you know, be stronger, more well-rounded students. Um, so typically the experience, at least here in Tennessee, has been that that GPA, um, the pass or fail, isn't calculated into that. Now, I say that and one of our local universities is still giving a pass or fail, but they've assigned a numerical value to that pass or fail. So there's actually a numerical value attached to it, as Cheryl so says. So they've given a random 85 to pass and they have a 90. Um, that idea of a pass, that idea of a pass is um, not what you want. You probably still want to go ahead and take the grade that you were working towards. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, Cheryl. That was a good context because some, some schools are uh, treating pass fail in calculation very differently than others who don't calculate it. So I want to go to Nishan now, who I know got some information from her local school districts about how they're treating pass fail in overall GPA in the Dallas area. Sure. Um, yes, I, I think, you know, then again, it's, it's very important for you to understand uh, what your grading system is in your district. Um, not only that, uh, for a ninth grader or whatever, whichever grade you're in, to be able to pull that document, whatever is in writing, and keep that on file. Because you want to have a frame of reference when you are applying to be able to send this document, this is what this means. So I wanted to, to say that because I see a lot of different districts doing a lot of different things. And so admission officers need to have uh, some type of background of what this pass or fail means. So I, I highly encourage you to go to your district's website and uh, pull down what they define pass or fail and what that means. But specifically in uh, for Dallas ISD, they will be making their final decision about pass and pass fail on April the 23rd. Um, they are leaning more towards uh, pass or fail, but they are looking at the numerical uh, grade system as well. So a decision has not been made. Um, however, if they go with the pass fail, they are saying that it will not count towards their rank or their GPA. And so um, that's why I said it's very important for you to understand how this will impact you and have a clear understanding about that. In Plano, um, they are going with the MET or, 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 or non-MET um, standards. And um, a 70 is considered um, mastery, you know, that they can move forward to the next grade level and they'll receive the credit. Um, but one of the things it says, um, teachers will record 100 in their grade books for students who meet the standard and a 69 for those who do not meet the standard. This is Plano mm -hmm. ISD. So think about this. You receive an 85, like your grade is an 85, but in their grade books for non met, non met, it's going to be 100. So not every pass is created equal. <laughs> Correct. And so that's why I think it's very important for you to go to your website and see exactly yeah. how that is interpreted. And so, so the yeah. follow up then is what if you were given a choice to, to be elected for a great letter grade versus a pass fail? Like should the student then go for the letter grade if he or she is given a choice? You know, I think that a letter grade always displays where that student is. Um, it could work to their advantage or it could work to their disadvantage, depending on where that student was before the six weeks uh, when this all took place. And so one of the things that I've, read, I've been reading is that some districts are looking at where were you before this happened? Mm -hmm. And they're going to take those grades and then take what you're doing now and do an average. So it kind of gets messy, right? And so you want to be able to look at, that's why you need to know where you were before and where you are now and keeping track. Documentation and make a decision. that you were mentioning. Yes, 
Yes, yeah. and make a decision. Now, I know that in Texas, the TEA, Texas Education Agency, actually has posted a grading system mm -hmm. guideline. And so um, that's something you might want to look at and, and teachers need to look at as they make decisions and, you know, making sure everything is fair. But I think yeah. it kind of goes back to, you know, this has been a shift in their environment. They may not have all the tools they needed that's to fine. be successful. Thank you, Nishan. Casey, anything to add on your end about the um, calculation of GPA? Yeah, um, you know, in, in California specifically, um, something interesting happened where the Board of Education came together with the UCs and the CSUs as well as the private universities and decided that to hold kids uh, harmless. So meaning they're not going to be um, uh, they're not going to, it's not going to count against them if your school does decide to adapt the pass fail, it will not count against you. So, um, and they're not going to count the, G, the GPA into your, over, or they're not going to count that semester into your overall GPA. So say you're a sophomore right now, they'll take your sophomore the spring semester, but they're not going to count that GPA into your second semester as a sophomore and, you know, so on. So that's really important important because they they really came together, which I think is um, really great as the state um, because they saw that this could be a real issue for all of our students. Um, so I, I do think it's important um, to note that um, in terms of the GPA with um, our with our juniors right now, you know, they want, you know, because they're only going to get their sophomore year as well as like the first semester of their junior year, they're not going to be able to get that other GPA that second semester. Um, so like Nishan and many others have mentioned, Courtney as well and Cheryl, just make sure that you're documenting everything. Um, I think with, in terms of the UCs and the CSUs, their deadlines are on November 30th. Um, for the application deadlines. So you want to make sure that, um, you know, you're, you're taking all your courses your senior year that you wanted to that are going to apply to your major. They're going to be looking at their, your senior year classes, but your GPA won't be calculated in the admissions decision. So, um, you know, it's just really important that you keep all that information documented. So when you're writing your essays and focusing on writing your essays for the UCs, you can mention any things that came up or, you know, when you're get, getting your letters from your teachers, um, any things that came up, any hiccups in that process. Awesome. Um, Thank you very much. So now, what, you know, everything that you guys have said is making me think of this question. Um, and I'm going to go to Courtney first about this. What if we have a very high achieving student, like 90 plus average in, in a class that's core, okay, maybe even an AP class, and now that class just went pass fail, you know, do like this student worked so hard, and now it's pass fail, given that he, he or she's going to get a P pass for it, but so will the student who made a 70. So this 90 plus student, is he or she at a disadvantage now that the grade is a pass itself? Yeah, that's a really great question, Ibrahim. And I think the hard answer is that it depends, right? It depends on, um, is the student a senior? Is the student a junior? What colleges um, is the student considering applying to, right? They're from state to state, it's different. Um, but I think um, again, it, I just go back to this idea of um, what we've been talking about regardless. So let's take a senior, for example, um, quarter three, they were doing so-so, but they really kind of towards the end of third quarter um, picked it up, really got into their study habits, and they were ready to knock it out fourth quarter and get, you know, a really high grade in eight or whatever. Um, and now we've moved to the pass-fail system. Um, they could be at a disadvantage in particular for merit-based aid, right? Um, that could, that would hurt, you know, a student mm -hmm. who had a 90%. Um, and then kind of the opposite for a student who, for a senior um, who was um, kind of below that. Um, and then now they're past fail. Well, um, the advantage is a college won't see maybe the lower grade. Um, and so I think it depends um, kind of where 
the student is in their, you know, academic trek and then where they're going. Um, but again, I just think we have to keep coming back to this idea of track everything, record everything, um, and be able to articulate either direction um, mm -hmm. for a school when and if they ask. I think that that's um, the best and most important advice for um, students at any level. Thank you. And Cheryl, I'm going to go to you with the same question, given that you do already teach pass fail courses. And what have you seen in terms of, you know, students who are high achieving and, you know, their classes have gone pass fail, especially for core courses? Yeah, um, those students, um, some, it's a, a definite maybe, you know, I have those students who are like, they're almost relieved and they take that sigh of relief um, because that figuring into the GPA kind of stops for them, um, but not my seniors. You know, my seniors who are now looking at that idea of a pass-fail, they're a little freaked out over that, if we're being honest, because they're like, okay, if colleges are looking at those eighth semester scores, um, how do I show that I may have been sloughing off, but I finally got it together, and now I don't have that opportunity to really show that. And this is that opportunity where they can always write that letter and say, dear college admissions officer, I need you to know, I know it didn't look so good for sophomore in the beginning of junior year, but my senior year, I really pulled it together and these are the things that I was doing. And then the world was hit with this pandemic, you know, and again, it goes back to that documentation. I feel like we just kind of keep circling that idea, but mm -hmm. that idea of being able to have that resource and being able to write back and say, this is what was going on um, at that point. Um, the other idea behind that pass or fail for students um, is that student, colleges, again, using that uh, senior that Courtney um, kind of gave us is that they're gonna still look at trend of grades. You know, they're going to have, you know, what they did in ninth, 10th and 11th grade in their English class or their math class. And so if they had that rocky freshman year and they were pulling it together, they'll consider that, hey, they were on a pretty good path. Um, the opposite is also true. And then I also think that we'll see colleges kind of put a little more weight on um, their extracurricular activities and those resumes that we've talked about on a couple of different times. I think those letters of recommendations that teachers are going to be writing over the next year is, will also be valued, um, maybe weighted a little differently than GPA. Mm -hmm. And then of course we know the t national test dates are really kind of getting messed up with College Board and ACT as well. So I kind of think that mix will also kind of take a back seat to some of those other ones that were not in the spotlight before. So I think we'll see some of those things growing um, as we kind of work through this eighth semester for some of our seniors. Excellent. Thank you. And I'll ask the same question, but for a, I guess, flipped scenario where the student is, you know, not doing that well in a class, in a core class specifically, maybe barely a 70 average. Could this student assume that he or she is now at an advantage because the class has gone to pass fail rather than a letter grade, which could have earned them a C in this case. So I'll go to Casey and Nishan about that. Casey, you can go first. Sure. Um, I just wanted to piggyback a little bit on what Cheryl was saying too about the student, the high achieving A student. Um, and this also goes well with the student that may have been getting a 70% or a C in the class. Um, those, you know, you have generally students tend to, A students are continually getting those A's. You, they might drop down a couple of grades here and there. So they generally have a similar pattern that they follow. And same thing with students that have like C averages. And so that's why, you know, they have the GPA because it is an average of what that student's doing. So um, I think it could improve a student's chance um, of getting into college and helping them because they're able to kind of focus on, you know, the content less and not worry so much on their grade. Um, in terms of the California schools, they require that you have a C minus or better. So that would be the cutoff. And that's what they've put out there is for, in order to get that pass grade, you'd have to definitely have a C minus or better in that. Um, 
the interesting thing about the UCs and the CSUs is they don't accept letters of recommendation. So it is harder for students um, because they're not able to, the teachers aren't able to give those letters. So it's really important for students that are applying to UCs to focus on their essays. There also is some supplemental um, areas where they can um, also talk about their grades in that. So, um, so they could say, hey, I was getting an A plus, I was getting 100% in this class, or vice versa, they could say, you know, I was getting a lower grade, but because I was able to get a pass, um, I learned the content a little bit more and wasn't worried so much about that grade. Um, but it is important that those students really look at those essays and really focus focus on those essays um, and supplementals in there. A lot of the CSUs have supplemental areas too. Um, they might be a little short couple paragraphs that you write, but it is an opportunity to explain yourself in those, um, in those applications. So I think that's a great point because um, additional information section on the college application uh, applications are typically um, disregarded by students. I think this, these four mm -hmm. cycles, five cycles we're going to have for college admissions, every student needs to utilize that additional information section to provide some sort of context to whether this is pass fail, maybe this is about SAT, ACT, maybe this is about a family situation, you've got to utilize that section. Even if it's only one paragraph, a few sentences explaining what happened and how it has impacted you. So that was a great advice. Thank you, Casey. And I'll go to Nishan with the same question about a student who's struggling. Is he or she at an advantage? Why or why not? Yes, um, I, I think that a struggling student can maximize um, the pass and fail uh, system because uh, this gives them the opportunity to actually uh, focus in on that particular class and get with their instructor. I, I go back to that. That communication is, is very important. I have that conversation um, with my kids all the time, especially now, even though they're in the uh, going to the seventh grade and going to the fifth grade, uh, with being engaged with their instructor, it can make a big difference of a 89 to, you know, a 70. It just depends. But what you'll find, too, is a lot of districts are uh, the pass and fail is equivalent um, to a student who will be able to redo their assignments so that they do um, go up to an 85. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I like about um the the pass fails a lot of schools are or districts are allowing the students to redo their work until they have mastered and and i think that that's that's important that you master the work um so a struggling a student definitely can um, um articulate as is already said by cheryl and all of my other colleagues um in your essay and so one of the things i would like to do as a as a golden nugget if you will is that that you get your journal and journal your days because you're not going to remember everything that went on every day journal your experiences in class if you you know whatever it is just jot it down just debrief 10 minutes five minutes get you some music and and journal it so you can go back and articulate that in your essays Thank you very much. And I'm cognizant of time. We got about 12 minutes. So I'll ask one final question myself, which is a big question, but I'm going to have to limit our panelists to maybe one to two minutes to allow us time to answer the Q&As that have been coming through. So that question is the million dollar question. Will pass fail system pass or fail the student in the college admissions process? So is it going to be a disadvantage? How are the colleges going to treat this? Knowing that we have over 4,000 colleges in the United States and different selectivity ratings for colleges, obviously they're all going to approach it differently, but what is your general advice? So let's just think about words of wisdom. Let's start with Courtney and then we'll go around. Yeah, this is the big question, right? Especially for class of 2021. Um, and so um, I think what I want to say is that it can go either way, right? It depends on how much um, the student engages with this time, whether this 
idea of past fail will help or hurt a student. Um, again, we keep talking about um, this idea of trajectory, right? That's what Cheryl mentions of grades and all of that. Um, but we also have to consider the other components of an application that we've talked a little bit about resume activities. Um, these things have been shut down almost completely in many, many states in terms of there aren't community service opportunities. Um, and so um, even though you have this idea of pass fail and the impact there on the GPA, let's think of the other components of the application as well. And so what can students do? How can students maximize this time during social isolation, which many of them are not familiar with? Um, and if a student engages fully, takes advantage of all opportunities, the pass fail situation will not hurt them, right? It's everything else that they've done in this time that can help them in the long run in terms of college admission. And so I think that that's my one main focus point um, for students right now is just to maximize their time. And you have to be creative with some of that, you know, um, use Zoom to do, um, to reach out to other students or, you know, engage in your community, right? Um, and so, yeah, just encouraging students to do that. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm going to go you, do it to you next. Same question. Yeah, uh, and Courtney did a great job answering that um, in that this is an opportunity for students to build a portfolio to to kind of take the GPA off the plate and really look at what is going to help me shine to those college admissions officers. What is going to show them the best me? And so this is an opportunity for students to really focus in, um, pull pieces that they, they should have from their docs and that they've done, revise some things, you know, work on some art projects for those art and humanities students that we have, you know, write a few songs, do what they can do so that they can really shine um, in those areas that don't typically get um, a voice when college admissions are considering that. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Thank you. I'll go to Nishan now. Yes, um, I, I agree with my colleagues. Um, I can't emphasize enough of being able to uh, write daily and um, work on your essays. One of the things I will say is that uh, colleges are looking um, they are, their students are already looking at pass fail options. And so um, this is not something that is foreign, will be foreign to them when you're applying. And so students are having, current students are having to make the decision, do they want a numerical grade or do they want pass or fail? And so I believe that they will look at your application holistically and um, documentation is important. So best wishes to you. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> Yeah, I think everybody hit on some really great points um, in terms of, you know, what's been going on. I do think um, that this is an interesting place for admissions officers, too, because they've never experienced anything like this. And this is probably going to change the way they see a lot of applications and see students. And they're seeing them in a more holistic view as opposed to just looking at your grades. So I think it's a real opportunity, like everybody else has been saying, to explore your creativity and use all those amazing skills that you guys have as these students that have come up living with technology and use that for your advantage and um, you know come up with some creative solutions that you've done uh, to, to tell people about and engage in your community over that way too. So I think it's a great opportunity to kind of start seeing things in a different light. Um, yeah. And I yeah I just wish everybody the best of luck with this process and um, but know that we are a nation are we're all going through the same thing mm -hmm. and you're not alone and it's not going to reflect poorly on you as a student where okay. they're all working together to make this work for everybody. Absolutely. And thank you for everyone's advice here. And I really echo it as well as the chief educational consultant at Fraud Education. One of the things that we put out 
you know, to the public to see is the top seven factors of college admissions when it comes to um, getting admitted. Top factor is GPA and or the class rank. And the second factor is the curriculum rigor that got you that GPA and or rank. So we're talking about those two top factors today going past fail, if, you know, for a temporary period of time. So if you go temporarily past fail, and it is, those are the two most important factors in college admissions, then there is going to be some sort of flexibility, but there needs to be a context attached to that flexibility with your journaling of, you know, your status in each class, with your communication of your teachers and counselors to provide that context, strength of your essays, extracurricular activities, SAT and ACT, if you can actually take it given the conditions that we're in. So we're thinking about all the other factors besides the top two that you can shine under. And if you can really showcase that, then you're not really at a disadvantage. Pass-fail system will not fail you. In fact, pass-fail system will pass you in the college admissions process. So with that, we have five minutes for Q&A for on Zoom. We already got some questions, so I will start with those. If you have any others, please send them over and we'll answer as best as we can. The first question comes to Casey. Casey, did I hear Casey say freshman year is not a consideration in college admissions, question mark. I thought mm -hmm. every year is reported, including grades for a repeated year for a reclassed boarding school student. Casey. So I was referring specifically to the um, CSU and the UC system. And, and don't get me wrong, freshman year counts and students have to pass their classes um, and you know get passing C minus or above. But specifically in California, um, you, for the UC and the CSU system, not private schools, this isn't um, with private schools, but for those systems, they don't count the GPA as in your freshman year. So your sophomore and junior year, they use your GPA, but they don't use your GPA for your freshman year. Thank you, Casey. And then the next question goes to Cheryl. Cheryl, in your introduction, you mentioned that Tennessee is an ACT state. Is this in terms of the preferred testing for high school or in terms of what the colleges within the state will accept? Oh, that's a great question. Um, at the, in clarifying that, the ACT is one of a graduation requirement. So um, most of our school systems and districts will give um, a state um, test during sometime during the year. So our students were going to take that test on March 31st and then it was bumped till April and now it's just not going to happen until September 22nd. So our juniors are losing this opportunity for that um, ACT test. Um, so while that is a part of graduation requirements, colleges will take both ACT and SAT scores. And I often encourage my students, um, especially students they've taken the ACT five or six times and we've done all this intervention and they're not growing. Um, hey, let's look at the SAT. Let's see what you can do there. It's a different type of test. It looks at different skills and you give the college an opportunity to really kind of weigh in on both of those. So the, our schools do take both of those tests. Excellent, excellent. So. Um... I'm checking to see if there's any other questions, but I don't see anything coming through on Zoom. I'm sure there is some on Facebook because we're also on Facebook Live. So what we'll do as our team here, our, our panelists, we will go back to the Fraud Education Facebook page and respond to any questions you may have on Facebook as well. This session is being recorded. So we, those of you who have registered to receive the link, you will receive the link as well. And there comes the question. Actually, we have another question. Um, how will pass fail affect GPA and school ranking? Okay, so that's a that that's a general question. I believe um, we answered the part of that the GPA, but the school ranking is a good point. So let's go to uh, Nishan about that because we are a very rank specific state here in Texas. So Nishan, let's start with that with you with you on that. Yes, um, what I'm seeing is districts are saying that it the pass fail will not go towards the the class rank. Um, I, I, I looked at that for uh, Plano and um, let's see. Dallas, I Dallas, see. Dallas. Yeah. yeah. So please go to your website and they will be able to articulate uh, that for you. Exactly. 
And anyone else about the ranking that you know of in your states, in your markets? No? Okay. Excellent. So while we are out of time anyway, I want to be respectful of everyone's time today. So we really appreciate your time and energy today. We, um, you know, packed in so much good information. <laughs> I thank my panelists for joining me today. Uh, this was very robust, very good conversation. And we will continue to have these webinars on a regular basis in different topics that uh, college admissions and COVID-19 is impacting college admissions. One of which is the SAT's announcement yesterday that they have canceled the June test and looking at SAT at home as well as ACT at home in the fall if schools continue to be closed. So we are planning on a webinar on SAT, ACT at home, whether this is a good idea or whether this would hurt or improve your chances of college admissions uh, in the next week or two. So please keep engaged on our social media pages, Fraud Education, as well as fraudeducation.com forward slash free webinars and contact us anytime you have any questions. Thank you for joining us today and see you soon. Take care.